I'm here with uh, Pierrette Domenica Simpson, survivor of the Andrea Doria, and she's also an author and documentarian. Happy to have you here. I'm very happy to be here and to meet you personally and uh, to get to know the group. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, uh, Pierrette, you are nine years old traveling on the Andrea Doria from Italy to the New World, America. Well, it was quite a unique immigration experience because I was not traveling with parents like most kids would. I was with my grandparents and we had decided to come to America to rejoin my mother, who I did not know. My mother had immigrated to America when I was 15 months old. So here I was, nine years old. I didn't want to come to America for many years. Ne neither did my grandparents want to leave their community in northern Italy, in the Piemonte. And uh, we got an ultimatum from my mother and said, I want my daughter to come to the United States, meet her new family. She had started a new family in America and uh, set it up so that I could have a better future. So here I was traveling with my grandparents who had left everything behind in their community, wow. uh, sold everything because they wanted to be a part of my life indefinitely. What, what did your grandparents do? How did they take care of you in Italy? They were just um, middle-class farmers, um, a little better than subsistence level, I would say. But uh, it was a very simple life at a farmhouse. Humble beginnings. Yes, yes. Very courageous of them. Uh, my grandmother, in fact, was also courageous for the fact that she hated water. She was so afraid of water. So for her to travel on water was just horrifying until she kind of got used to it until until the end of the trip when everything hell broke loose. Um, so I'm very grateful to my grandparents for the sacrifices they made on my behalf but I also have guilt feelings because of everything that ensued. And that's so typical Italian that, you know, the guilt and the sacrifices that we make for our children, our grandchildren. So what happens on board uh, the night of the collision? The night before we were to land in New York, we were near Nantucket Island and we were in deep fog as we were all day long, and the foghorn had been sounding at intervals as prescribed by maritime law. Um, because of the dense fog and the danger. So my grandmother and I were in the uh, social hall of the immigrant class. Not immigrant class, I guess third class, I should call it. It was mostly immigrants. And um, we were celebrating the last night on board and arriving in the new world. My grandfather thought it would be prudent to stay in his cabin down below and uh, stay with his briefcase and get a good night's rest because we had a huge day ahead of us to greet the new world. At 11.10 p.m., as we were dancing, we felt an incredible jolt and it threw us all off our feet and the lights went off and then they would go on and off for a while. We finally heard a message that said uh, to go to the muster stations, but people don't remember if it was in Italian or in English. The uh, sound system had been damaged, so it was very hard to hear. We didn't know what to do. So we sat on the floor after we had gained some composure. Many people were hurt. Broken limbs, blood flowing. We just sat on the floor in prayer circles and we repeated the Ave Maria. 
and the words now until the hour of our death amen just uh they resonated uh in in real life and uh we just kept going down and down and uh it was punctuated by a crackling noise or you know just noises and there were smells of fumes all over we could see the the the, the semen coming uh, from the the all different cabins and from the captain um trying to help us and they were uh, in white uniforms and covered with soot and oil um and they were frantic we were frantic but we kind of calmed down and kept praying and praying and then um my grandfather appeared and i'll never forget his eyes as he he appeared through the um i think it was sliding doors and he um his eyes were just bulging out of his head like he had seen a ghost and he was carrying his briefcase and he had a hat on his head and he had all his clothes on now i found out later that he had treaded through water in the hallway that he had fought his way up the stairs because people were jamming the stairways to get upstairs yet he managed to keep his briefcase his hat his clothes and and find us somehow he found us in the dark and in the smoke and uh, so we were all together we were united thank god so he joined us and uh, we don't know how long quite it was but we had realized that the captain captain piero calamai our hero had uh, sent an SOS throughout the eastern um, eastern seaboard. Ships were coming our way, all kinds of ships, uh, navy ships, um, fruit freighters, coast guard, and the Ile de France, a huge French liner that heard the message, and the captain, Captain de Baudillon, he decided on his own that he would turn his ship around in spite of the fog, not really knowing anything other than, Captain, we need your help. And uh, he uh, went in spite of all insurance liabilities. He was our hero. He came to the site. And of course, the ships that came, the rescue ships could not come close to us because we were sinking. What happened was the ship went up in the air during the collision and then kind of went to the center and then listed to the left. Then it went back to the right and then it didn't stay there. It went to the right side, the starboard side, where um, it would stay. And it was 15, 18, 20 degrees immediately. Something that naval architects had never imagined would happen. So what we realized, uh, well, someone came to the uh, social hall where we were and said there were rescue ships that came our way and there would be lifeboats and we would be saved. And we thought, well, how are we gonna get out of this room? It was so inclined. So we crawled, somehow we crawled up to the deck doors and we made uh, a human chain. We pushed against the guardrail and we made it to the lower side of the ship where there were two foreigners, two young men, maybe in their twenties, that. Um, tied a rope around my waist and dangled me over the incline and i had a, the rope just you know dangled me down below where i couldn't see where i was landing as far as i knew i was going into the ocean because the lifeboat was under the incline if you can imagine the bravery of the sailors who came from the Ile de France and other ships to save us. 
so I landed in the lifeboat and then I looked up and my grandparents of course were frantic because lifeboats were coming and going coming and going and uh, families were being separated fortunately uh, they were able to come down the rope on their own my grandfather well first my grandmother holding her purse coming down the rope and you recall how she was so afraid of water somehow she made it and then one leg went into the water before getting to the lifeboat she was pulled in she was screaming and then my grandfather came down with the briefcase in one hand and a hat on which was an incredible sight because most people were half naked um, they wore curtains or shower curtains or or something to cover themselves their clothes were all ripped and here he was looking elegant except that he had his pants rolled up to his knees from the treading water in the hallways and uh, they landed in the lifeboat with me so we we're all together but then it was one of the worst parts of the whole affair because as naval architects would explain when you are in a ship you're in a cocoon you feel like you you have some kind of safety when you have to leave the ship and go into the open ocean it, it's a nightmare and it was nighttime it was foggy now the, the moon was coming out so we did have some light and eventually quite a bit of light but we here we were partial fog partial moonlight and uh, rowing to the Ile de France for about 45 minutes and everybody was vomiting so I could still smell the, the stench and we could see suitcases soggy suitcases floating around us and beams and and clothing it was like the ride from hell the ride of the ancient mariner horrific experience horrific and heroic at the same time exactly and not knowing if you're going to make it as you're trying to as you're trying to survive exactly and then we got to the Ile de France and there was no way to get in so the sailors dropped a Jacob's ladder down the side now some people remember going up in in lifeboats that were picked up and and lifted we didn't have that for some reason so here I was climbing a skyscraper pretty much in the ocean and my grandparents watching down below and I must have had someone behind me protecting me I can't imagine I did it on my own the Jacob's ladder was about this wide you know and you're climbing up climbing up and I remember getting to the top and there was a, a lovely French sailor there and he said bonsoir and welcome me in and then my grandparents came in and there was a woman there also beside him and uh, I found out later when I was telling this story in my Spanish class in college and she this woman the professor was looking so excited about the story and I thought oh my gosh she loves my Spanish <laughs> I'm gonna get an A on this and she said I was that woman oh wow I was there helping pull the survivors into the Ile de France so that was our miracle what a connection a totally unplanned connection did they did your new family your aunts and your stepfather did they know ahead of time because they weren't cell phones or really anything uh, anything compared to the technology we have today but did they know ahead of time that the andrea doria had sunk or had collided Yes. So they weren't. So they didn't really even know if you were survivors. No, except until we were able to send a telegram. So from the Ile de France, uh, it took a long time, and so they they knew we were in danger or we had been killed. That's all they knew, and then they finally got a telegram from us that said "Tutti salvi." all saved i understand that it was one of the greatest sea rescues in history yes. and um you've managed to document what really happens 
um, during the collision, and uh, there was some question about the captain's responsibility. It was never proved to be innocent uh, because it never went to court. It, we had pretrial hearings in New York, and they went very badly for the Italians. They didn't know English, whereas the Swedes, the, I, I say the Swedes, the Swedish officers knew English, some of them. Um, their testimony was not correct, as I proved later on. Um, the captain went into the hospital, Captain Nordenson, not Captain Kalamai. So there were pauses and there was all kinds of political stuff. And meanwhile, while all of this was coming, um, the, the pretrial hearings were, were continuing. Uh, there were um, survivors and their families making huge claims for loss of life and loss of property. And so Lloyds of London, who was the insurer for both the Stockholm and the Andrea Doria. Both ships had one in the same insurer. Uh, they realized that it was gonna be the costliest maritime disaster in history. So they thought, why do a trial? Let's, let's, let's uh, cut this short. They announced that it was impossible to discern fault and that the uh, trials would be over, and that there would be no fault given, uh, and uh, there would be some compensation to the survivors and the families of uh, the deceased. Lost 46 people on the Andrea Doria, and many hurt, and uh, so it, it never went to trial. So the captain was never legally found innocent. Well, when I discovered this cold case that I say has been, had been um, laying in the coffers of injustice for almost 50 years when I found out it was there through meeting this Captain Mern, um, I, was, I was furious. I was so angry because I had been part of the public that had been blaming both ships. Some people blamed just the Andrea Doria. This was after World War II. So it was, you know, people thought of Mussolini, people thought of the ignorant immigrants. Um, there, there was just so much prejudice. So nobody thought, gosh, this Captain Kalamai, his life is ruined unjustly he'll and he never sailed again because nobody had bothered to publish what had really happened and the fact that he had carried out the greatest sea rescue in peacetime history it was just overwhelmed by by the politics by the the nasty court trial uh, uh, pre-trials and uh, so i made sure that i called the book Alive on the Andrea Doria, the greatest sea rescue in history, to give him that credit. That has been my mission since 2003, starting with the book, and then I wrote a book for um, young readers. It can be for adults also, called I Was Shipwrecked on the Andrea Doria, the Titanic of the 1950s. And my mission was to interest young people to study uh, marine forensics. So I made the characters nine years old, 16 years old, and inspire them to study shipwrecks. I was a teacher for 37 years. I taught foreign languages. So teaching to me was always of utmost importance to reach young people. So they so did that before getting to the next level, as you know. Which I wanted, to, I'd love to segue into right now because um, you have uh, a docufilm and a script that you've written. I wrote the original script for the docufilm, which wasn't the best script in the world. He made it great. <laughs> Luca made it great. And, uh, and then I produced it. And you produced Of course, I was part artistic director as well. And so I know that um, this is 
Uh, the script is for a feature film and a television uh, docu series on your your story. Because the, the docu film did very well. It went around the world. We did Canada, United States, Italy. Um, got into many film festivals. I believe it was 18, uh, and also went to the Italian Parliament. We got to Hollywood. We got to, to Toronto. We got to Ischia. I mean, we we got around. And uh, we won a couple dozen recognitions and awards, including Best Feature uh, Documentary uh, at the Salerno International Film Festival. So we don't want to stop there. So Luca and I put our heads together and we came up with a script for hopefully a feature film or a TV miniseries. And we are at the point now in spite of the pandemic, where we are seeking uh, co-production opportunities. Because I think it's important that Italy and the United States, my two countries, <clears throat> and the two countries of the two ports of the Andrea Doria, um, would, would be uh, involved with the co-production. When I tell people about this, they said, but there hasn't been any other film made on the Andrea Doria? No, there's been my docu-film. There's been a lot of documentaries, a few that I've, um, many that I've participated in, but never a feature film. And this is a story that has so many layers. You know, it's, it's about immigration, sure. It's about a shipwreck, sure. sure. But it's also about justice. Yes. It's also about clearing uh, history and, uh, and the historical record. It's, uh, it's about family sacrifice, so many facets. And you know what I realized? I did not mention the name of the docu-film. It's Andrea Doria, Are the Passengers Saved? And I guess maybe this is appropriate for an ending. Those were the very last words of Captain Piero Calamai on his deathbed in a semi-comatose state. He whispered to his daughters and his wife, are the passengers saved? So I wanted to mention that. It, and if you don't mind, it is on Vimeo.com if anybody wants to, to watch it. <laughs>